What's up, Crossroads? Pastor Epi here, and I'm so excited to do the online message for you today. So in case you're visiting us in the campus or visiting us in a different state, hey, how you doing? Hi, Mom. Okay, hey, we're gonna continue in our series today in First and Second Peter, and I am really excited about this next portion of Scripture. In fact, can I just start off with a story, one of my favorite stories. It's actually from a movie called Facing the Giants. Now, in this story, in case you never watched the movie before, this underdog team is with this underdog coach who has now new revelation of Jesus Christ. He actually gave his heart to Jesus and he's starting to see the world in a whole new way. He actually approached his coaching career in a very apathetic, no, no zealousness, no passion kind of way. In fact, that's why the team kept on losing. But he started to implement certain biblical truths to encourage the team. So this is one scene. They're, they're doing actually really well and they're about to get to the playoffs. But as this team finally hears who they're gonna go against, their, their whole entire attitude just changes. In fact, there's one character, his name is Brock. Brock hears who they're gonna go against. It's their longtime rival. He's like, oh, we're just gonna lose just like every single year. Like, whatever, coach. And the coach is trying to encourage him. Like, no, guys, we're gonna do it. We're a team. We're united. He's like, oh, until we die, until we get beat. Like, come on, coach. And his, his attitude started to rub off on the whole entire team that they started to act defeated before they even played one second in the, in the football game. So the coach said this. All right, Brock, get up. Get on the field. All right, coach. He's like, what I want you to do, I want you to bear crawl for 20 yards without giving up, without quitting. I want you to do it, Brock. And Brock's like, 20 yards? That's easy, coach. Oh, it's easy? 50 yards. Oh, come on, coach. Like, I'm tired. We just got done with practice. Not only that, I want you to carry one of your teammates on your back. Oh, come on, coach. Blindfolded. And he just stopped talking because he didn't want anything else to change. So the next scene comes to where Brock is on the field and he starts moving and he has his teammate on his back and I have a picture for you right here and he starts to move more and more and he gets past the 10, he gets past the 20, he gets past the 30 and his arms start wiggling and his arms start shaking and so finally Brock is saying, I can't do it, I can't do it coach, am I finally there? Come on coach, keep on going Brock and one of the most powerful moments in the whole entire film. This coach is cheering on this guy who has already been defeated. He says, come on, Brock, keep on going. Keep on moving. One more step, Brock, one more step. And the scene goes on for maybe two more minutes as you see Brock now crying, saying, I can't do it, coach. I can't do it. And he keeps going one step at a time. You look at his teammates and his teammates are just befuddled. Like they are silenced. Their jaws are falling to the floor because soon after, at the end of that scene, Brock finally just collapses and he says, did I do it, coach? Did I make it? The coach said this, Brock, take off your blindfold. Not only did you do it, but now you're in the end zone. Do you see what happens when you don't quit? Do you see what happens when you put faith in yourself? Do you see what happens when you keep on going? You can do it, Brock. You're a leader. People are watching you, Brock. Don't be defeated, but walk in victory. Whew. That can preach on its own. And that's one of my favorite scenes because that's how life is so many times. So many times our, our brains can already be defeated because it's so powerful as we, as believers, even though we may know that we're more than conquerors, even though we can know that we are children of God, once again, we can walk in defeat. Dare I even say, okay, I'm gonna say it. Dare I even say that sometimes, even as believers, not only do we walk in defeat sometimes, but sometimes we actually live, respond, and think as if there is no God. I said it, I know, I know, I know. Let me prove it. You might say, yeah, I know God exists. Yeah, I know these biblical truths, but but this bill is way too expensive for me to pay. But this one situation right here, I can't believe, like, where, you, where are you, God? There's this one medical condition, God. Like, I've been praying for healing. Where are you? I'm just gonna fix it myself. This one situation that's in your life, you're like, you know what? You're taking too long. You are too silent. I'll take the reins. And that's how we act as if there is no God. Now, 
there is a cost by walking in defeat. The cost is this, not only does it rob us of peace and it robs us of joy, but it robs us of how we carry ourselves. Okay, can we just be real real quick? Maybe by us walking in defeat, whether because you're, you're walking in defeat, like what's gonna happen to my job? What's gonna happen to this relationship? What's gonna happen to this opportunity? What about my identity and all that? As we walk in defeat, maybe we take it out on our kids. Maybe we chew them out because of the stress of the job. I can't hit a due date. I can't hit that time. Like, ah, and like your kid, your kid is just acting like a kid. And you're like, why are you acting like a kid right now? And you chew them out. Maybe this stress and the situation causes us to lash out at our spouse. Or maybe, you know what, fine. <laughs> I'll tolerate my kids even when like, I'm at the end of my rope. I'll be nice to my, my spouse, even though like, oh my gosh, I can just flip a switch at any time. But then you get to the restaurant to an innocent waiter and maybe the food's a little bit cold or a little bit too warm. I don't know what your business is, but what happens? And you just lash out at them as well. You see, when you walk in defeat, oftentimes you try to numb the pain and the humiliation by other means other than by God. Maybe for you that, that you might struggle with anger, maybe lashing out is what makes sense for you to kind of feel like you finally have that control. Since your world is spinning, like I have some kind of semblance. Maybe it's looking at certain websites that you shouldn't be looking at, right? Like I get to escape for a second. Maybe it's playing video games nonstop. At least I get to escape for a second. Because once again, if you're not putting God on the throne, even in the worst of times, you try to find something that's gonna numb the pain. And so what Peter wanted to do, he wanted to make sure the original audience right here did not numb the pain, that they did not walk in defeat. In fact, let's talk about the audience of this letter right here. Peter was writing to a people who were both taken from their homes from mass persecution and those that said, you know what? I'm gonna leave everything to evangelize to this world. In a nutshell, the history, the world at that time, you had some crazy conquerors. You see, for this original audience here, they were originally in Israel and they were in Jerusalem. Titus comes up and Titus is a bad dude. And what he would do, he would crucify men, women, and children on the way up to the temple. And not only did he go to the temple, but he set it on fire where the gold melted in between the cracks and the soldiers turned every single stone over to get that gold. Fulfilling that one prophecy where Jesus said, not one stone will be left unturned. But then you had Nero. Nero was a horrible leader. Long story short, he started persecuting the Christians, killing hundreds and thousands of Christians, making them a form of entertainment as they were martyred in front of so many people just for entertainment. Now, once again, real quick, it's so easy to breeze by these original audience listeners here but these are real life people that suffered horrendous deaths. These people here feared every single day, possibly because their kids put their faith in Jesus. Where you and I normally would cheer kids, you know, I put my faith in Jesus, I got baptized, yeah. Like we might cheer, which is a great reason to cheer, but can you imagine the original audience if they proclaim Jesus, Nero is coming for you. And he's gonna feed you to lions. He's gonna feed you to gladiators without winking an eye. Like he will do that. And so they were ripped from homes. They were ripped from comfort. They were ripped from safety nets. Now, in case you didn't watch the, the last sermon by Pastor Rich, you need to go check it out. Because last week he talked about hope. That's how Peter started this word, this letter right here. He talked about a hope where you could walk in defeat. In fact, I wouldn't blame the original audience if they were walking in defeat. Like, man, they lived a life that I wouldn't want. But Peter says this, verse one and two, he says that you have been elected and chosen by God. In verse three, God not only saved you, but he's given you not only a hope, but a living hope an unending hope that will lead to incorruptible inheritance. 
And then he says this, for though you face hard times, that these people that have prophesied about salvation, about hope, about identity and all that, you are actually able to live in it. You are able to actually live in this hope of salvation, of knowing that God is your God, that you are children of the most high, that angels actually look in and say, I don't get it. I am baffled that Jesus would die for these people. Like, Jesus, don't you see what these humans are doing? Like, even after they come to salvation, like, Lord, don't you see how imperfect they are? Like, I don't get it. Because for you Bible nerds, angels will never experience salvation. But you and I, who are made in the image of the Most High, get to, and they're baffled by it. So Peter would say this in, in the first, first part of chapter one, don't walk in defeat. You're ripped from homes, your lives are on the line, but you are more than conquerors. You guys have a living hope. The story is not done. There's still more, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So point number one, note takers, you ready for this? Be sober minded. First Peter chapter one, verse 13 says this, therefore, after having all this hope, even angels looking into it, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Other translations would say this, Peter's saying there, therefore, gird up your loins. Or another way to say is, therefore, roll up the sleeves of your mind. Therefore, even though you're going through hell right now, therefore, even though you have a living hope, therefore, there's a living God that has chosen you, get your mind right. The concept of being sober-minded right here is a picture that you need to intentionally Get rid of thoughts that would sway to mess up your vision where you lose control of your thought life. Can we get real real quick? How many of us over obsess over situations or conversations or whatever, and we are so inebriated in a way that we can't even see straight. But what if this happens? And what if that happens? And we catastrophize everything. Peter would say this, be sober-minded. Have that self-control. But then he says this, set your hope. He didn't say just just set your hope. He says, set your hope fully, not partially, not a little bit, but fully onto God, onto the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I, I did a little experiment earlier today with my kids. And so I wanna just really show you what it might look like to set your hope fully on God and maybe some of our hesitancy to do that. Check this out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time to do this experiment with my children. Okay, so as I'm trying to focus on fully trusting in God, his character, his promises, everything, it's kind of like this. Now, I'm gonna have my Lily, my youngest daughter right here. Come here, Lily. Hey, look at me. Hey, do I love you? Yeah. All my heart? Yeah. Okay, do you trust me? Will I catch you? Yeah. Okay, let's see if she actually trusts me. So I'm gonna keep right here. Lily, on the count of three, you're gonna look back right here and you're gonna fall. Woo! Okay, but don't move your legs. You ready? One, two, three. Oh, she actually truly trusted me. Yay! Let's see if my other one actually trusts me. All right, turn around. Hey, do you fully trust me that I have you no matter what? Yeah. You won't fall and break your head? Yeah. You won't be a Humpty Dumpty? Uh, okay, here we go. Cross your arms. Don't look back. I'm going to be all the way back here. Yeah, yeah, trust me. I got you. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, he actually trusted me. This has never happened, folks. It's crazy. Okay, here's my oldest. He's nine going on 15. <laughs> he just spit on me, too. Okay, hey, do you trust me that I got you, that I love you, I'll protect you no matter what, even if it feels like I'm really distant? Yeah, even if it feels like I'm really far away and I'm, oh man, my arm is still sore from the other day. You trust me? Trust me fully? In three, two, one. (laughs) Two out of three is not bad. (laughs) Okay, 
I practice that with my kids, and I tell you guys, that was a miracle, okay? <laughs> they have always failed that experiment. So I was like, oh, man, this would be a great, you know, object lesson right here. <laughs> but they proved me wrong. They had faith in me. Oh, just kidding. I'll, I'll, I'll get them dessert tonight for that. But here you and I are, to be just like my kid. And if I were to symbolically be the father, Though I might feel like I'm far away or you might feel like God is far away, he will always catch you because you set your hope fully on what? The grace. The grace is unmerited favor. This is God saying, I am for you. There's nothing you can do to earn my love. There's nothing you can do to earn my favor. There's nothing you can do to earn my blessing but I give out of who I am, and that is a grace you could base your hope on. Let me simplify it real quick. Your world is turning upside down. You can rest fully in the hope that God is with you, even in the darkest valley of death that God will walk with you every single step of the way, that if you are inflicted, if you're in pain, if you're in trouble or whatever you may be, you are not alone, but set your hope fully. Trust fall, he'll catch you, amen? For you younger people, uh, I simplified it like this. Be sober-minded, calm down. Verse 14, here we go. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. It's interesting here that Peter is trying to minister to these people, but now he flips the script. He says, look, I'm not just saying that you are a chosen people, but I'm saying as obedient children. Children of who? Of the most high. Not only that, but like the idea is as he calls them children, and if God is their parent, their father, start acting like him. Start being like your father and stop being conformed to the passions of how you acted before you came to him. So point number two, it's godly conduct. Verse 15 says this, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. As his child, we act like the father. And just like our heavenly father is set apart. Can we, can we just praise the Lord real quick? Can we have a praise break? All right, you don't need to play music. It's all good. Okay, here's a praise break. Our father who art in heaven, number one, ready, is it? Is alive. He is set apart from any other deity out there. All those deities are imaginary. All those deities are statues. All those deities are of people that are in the dirt right now. But our father is alive and he is set apart. Our God is holy. He is just, he is pure. He is blameless. He is all powerful. He is mighty. He is creative. He is father and he is God and he is your parent. And he is set apart. That's why we holy we, we sanctify his name. We set it apart like God, your name, your title here is holy. So therefore, I need to be holy. And that means set apart. I need to be different than the world. Where the world will act with anger, where the world will act with lust, where the world will act for its own, looking out to build its own kingdom, you be different. Be set apart. Be holy. Now, for you Bible theologians, look at this. You're gonna love this, ready? You also, once again, be holy. Can you circle, underline, put a star for you people, put, put a heart if you want around the word be. Number one, look at this. The word be here is a command. It's not an option. You might say, well, it's for that Christian who's been a Christian for so long. It's for that person that went to school or whatever. No, you too are commanded as his child, where he tells you once again, as obedient children. No option. I command you, be. Okay, number two is this. It's an heiress, which means this. That command is for now. It's not when you think you're ready. It's not like, okay, well, well, let me clean up this real quick, or let me go do this, let me go do that. No, no, now, 
right now. I, I'm thinking about my childhood here. I told you now. Anyways, yeah, now. But here's the third part that makes this phenomenal. Are you ready for this? It's a command that's to be done right now, but it's written in the passive. Now, without geeking out on you, the passive means it's an action that's done upon you. You lost me. Okay, a passive action is if I were to push somebody, my act is passive. That person moves because I moved that person. So here Peter says, you be, because there's an action being done upon that believer and the person doing the action is the Holy Spirit. So what am I trying to say is this, choose to allow yourself to become holy not based upon your efforts, not based upon your energy, but based upon solely this, submission and utter dependence upon him. You see, Jesus raised the level of standards of ethics and morals and all that. And it wasn't raised so we can try to do it on our own. No, it was raised so we could say, God, I can't do it on my own. I desperately need you. And he promised that he'll never leave us, never forsake us. He promises that dunamis, that dynamite power. He promised that he would help us to get there by his power and by his might. Now, let me summarize verse 17 for you. They were called to live a holy life that included an awareness of God, of constant reverence. It's kind of like this. There's a Latin term called coram deo. Now, coram deo means this. It means to live before the presence of God. Now, w- w- let me illustrate with this real quick. Back in the day, when I was in elementary school, I wasn't the best kid, right? I wasn't as good as my kids. I, you know, I would cuss a lot, right? I'd say a lot of jokes I can't say here, right? I would fight. I would do all this stuff. But in class, I'd be the biggest class clown I could possibly be. And so one day the teacher said, Epi, if you do not shape up, I'm going to call your mama. Now, the thing is, guys, I'm telling you guys, that was a huge threat to me. Like, I don't want my mama to be called, but you know what? I wanted to be funny and I wanted to, you know, impress this one girl one time. And so I I did what I did. And the teacher said, I warned you, I'm going to call your mama. And so she called my mama. Now, my mama had a full-time job at that time. And so... Any time away from the job, oh man, she was not happy about it. It wasn't like, oh, a relaxing day watching my son not behave. So my mama would come to school and I remember being in class one time and I was once again acting a fool and the teacher said something. I was about to say something dumb, but I felt it. Oh, you you know what I'm talking about? Like I felt it. My mama was sitting in the back of the room, 20 feet away from me, but I felt that stare. I felt that glare. And as I looked back, because I knew I felt it, I saw my mama mouth the words, boy, you better not. Oh man, my my hand went down. I was the best behaved kid of the day. I lived before the presence of my mom. But now, Coram Deo means to live before the presence of God to know that he is consciously and always aware of you. Maybe not like my mama, but he looks at you saying, I love you. I'm invested. I'm watching. He's not watching with the clipboard like, oh, I knew you're gonna mess up today. Like again, come on. No, he's like, come on, you could do this. I'm here if you need me. Talk to me. To live in the constant awareness of God, that reverence, that awe, that fear of God. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let me just comment real quick on this. The reason for hope, the possibility to become holy, set apart, didn't come in a cheap way that we can have a faint hope, but it's a reality and a command based on Jesus paying the ultimate price. 
I shared in one of our classes for Revelation is this, that as Jesus shed his blood, it, one pin drop for me, I feel so unworthy of. But he fully bled out for the sake of humanity to pay the wages of sin, past, present, and future. This precious currency that was shed before time began, saying, I will be that lamb that will be slain. I am the solution. Once again, I'm not worthy. And yet how many of us play games of like, God, you can forgive this, you can forgive that, but you can't forgive this one thing. God, you forgive this, you forgive that, but the shame that I still struggle with because of that one time in my life or that constant thing that I do, like you can't forgive that. No, he paid the ultimate price to cover every single sin. Don't walk in defeat walk in the victory, walk in the hope, walk in the calling that Jesus paid for. Amen? All right. So point number three, pure heart. In verse 22, it says this, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So let me land the plane here, church. Don't walk in defeat. Don't obsess and live as if there's no God. Stop lashing out at others and yourself, but live in the hope of Jesus. Live as a people who are set apart and holy, who is called to surrender and just simply be. To allow God to say, God, today, work in my heart. God, today, my attitude is yours. God, today, my, my shadow areas, my areas of growth are yours. God, today, my hands, may they be used for your kingdom. My feet, God, today, would you lead me to people to present your gospel, to give a word of hope. God, today, would you break my heart for what breaks yours. God, today, would you use my brain to focus on your word. God, today, would you use my mouth to speak the word of God everywhere and anywhere. God, God, today would I live for you to live as a person who believes that God is not only alive, but God is watching me and God is with me and God is working on me to simply be, be set apart and be holy. So back to our picture right here. Remember that story about Brock? You might be just like Brock, who's going on the 20, the 30, the 40, your arms are shaking, your arms are moving. You wanted to just give up. Just like the original audience, the persecution, the fear, the anxiety and all of that. You have Jesus who's just like that coach saying, don't give up, don't give up, keep on going, keep on going, keep on moving. Even when the fire is an all time high, even when you're living out your worst nightmare, just as Brock got to the end zone, you too, my brother, my sister, I tell you, this nightmare you're living through, it's momentary. This nightmare that you're living right now is temporary. Those fears about the bills, oh my gosh, by this time next year, you won't be another thought. I, I, I love this one quote, it says this, what's one thing you were fearing about five years ago? Do you remember? Some of you are like, I can't remember five minutes ago, okay. Yeah, my sermon's that memorable, great. No, but like five years ago, do you remember what you were losing sleep about? Isn't our God faithful? The faithfulness of God in the past demands your trust for today. Trust in him. So rather than being the punching bag to your issues, allow your hope and your trust, the willingness to just be not only impact your life, but allow it to impact everybody else in your community and in your family and that comes around you, amen? It'll speak more volumes than a 30 minute sermon. So Father, I thank you so much for this word of hope. 
that God, even when our lives feel like they turned upside down, even as we feel like everything is just so chaotic right now, we have a living hope that you are a God that pursues, that you are a God that loves, you are a God that empowers, and you are a God that has given us the victory of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I ask for anybody that hears my voice or watches this video, Lord, that they too will walk in your victory and no longer walk in defeat. That, God, before we complain, we praise. Before we yell, Lord, we shout to you in worship. God, before we give up, we get on our knees and we turn to you for wisdom and hope. God, allow us once again to walk fully and completely in the living hope of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.